Okay, so this is our pre-reading lecture for a reading by Mike Davis um, called Fortress LA. It's going to get into some debates about public space in Los Angeles. You'll probably notice that there will be some overlap um, in terms of our discussion of what was going on in 19th century Paris and what's going on in 20th century Los Angeles. So kind of keep that in mind as we step into um, this week. Okay, so <clears throat> like I said, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on L.A. in the 80s and 90s. Um, Davis published his book in 1990, so we want to sort of have a sense of what was going on around him as he was writing um, his book and the chapter that we're reading, Fortress L.A. And then I'm going to go over some key terms that he uses quite a bit um, throughout his chapter. And then just um, want to give you a couple of ideas and concepts to keep in mind as you're thinking about while you're reading the chapter. Okay. So let's talk about LA in the 80s and 90s. All right, there's a lot going on. Um, and this is just a little bit um, to help us situate what Davis is talking about. All right, so what we are beginning to see is this kind of development and ramping up of a set of practices on the part of the Los Angeles Police Department um, that reflected a new approach to the policing of minority communities and the policing of the homeless and the policing of the poor, as we'll talk about um, as well. So what we begin to see here is that um, money that's coming from the federal level is being used to um, justify the actions of the Los Angeles Police Department, who are essentially criminalizing everyday life for people of color. Um, so what we begin to see is that the LAPD develops a set of kind of traits um, to utilize in the policing of communities of color in LA. And this includes clothing, this includes uh, the color of one's shoelaces, so really minute things. So when we're thinking about this, we want to um, keep in mind our emphasis on public space as well. So if you um, find yourself out on the street and the LAPD thinks your shoelaces are the wrong color and you're on the wrong street, um, these are um, being used to justify um, arrests. Um, and so I use this kind of small example to give us a sense of how one's movements through public space um, is changing throughout the 80s and into the 90s as well. So essentially what this amounts to is making racial identity and appearance a crime. So the way that you show up in public space is um, being utilized as a way to um, engage in false arrest and in, to engage in the harassment of individuals who look suspicious, right? This kind of um, development of um, a set of traits. Okay, so um, we see this really um, becoming amplified in the late 80s, so in the years that um, Davis is doing the research for his book. Um, so we see this um, operation being staged by the Los Angeles Police Department um, in response to um, some of the issues facing Los Angeles at that time, including um, the sale of drugs and gang violence as well. The Los Angeles Police Department expanded their approach um, and engaged in this campaign of mass arrests that was called Operation Hammer um, that lasted for about, um, I believe, nine months from 1987 to 1988. Um, 50,000 people were arrested, including active gang members and also ordinary citizens of color, so regular people. Um, so in April of 88 is when we saw the most arrests happening with 18,000 people arrested in one month. And out of those 18,000 people who were arrested, just about a handful were convicted of actual crimes. So everyone else who was caught up in this kind of massive sweep um, was arrested and convicted of no crimes. So this is really important for us to keep in mind because this is telling us about, so what was it like to walk around and exist in the 80s and 90s in Los Angeles um, during this era of the stepped up policing. And so one of the things that you may be um, already making a connection to is that this late 80s, early 90s moment is um, at the kind of threshold of two really significant um, cultural movements and events in Los Angeles. On the one hand, um, we see um, West Coast gangster rap coming of age out of this era, and on the other hand, um, the uprisings of the early 1990s in LA in response to the beating of Rodney King are both coming out of this era of um, hyper-policing and maximal approaches to um, this kind of campaign of mass arrests as well. Okay, 
So when we're thinking about how um, gangster rap works, um, we can think about it as another form of critique, right? Mike Davis is writing a scholarly book, um, and these artists are engaged in a different form of critique, but they're talking about the same transformation. So we want to sort of keep that in mind as well. Um, and so as we are probably familiar with um, this sense that um, gangster rap is critiquing a set of practices, just like the ones I just described, or with the beating of Rodney King, um, right, Ice Cube, who's a member of NWA, suggests, right, it's been happening for years, it's just that we didn't have a camcorder. And I'm sure that we are making this um, connection to our current utilization of smartphones to document um, police brutality that has always been a part of life in over-policed communities. Um, so Ice Cube is sort of noting that in 1992 um, when we see this massive uprising in Los Angeles in response to police brutality. Um, so this author, Robin D.G. Kelly, who I highly recommend um, reading, he argues that um, the uprising in 92 um, emphasizes the way that um, gangster rap is sort of offering an ethnographic or firsthand account of what it is actually like to be a criminalized youth. What does that mean from the first person perspective, not from the ivory tower, but from a firsthand um, moment. So thinking about um, the work of NWA alongside the work of Mike Davis is something that's really important for us to do. Mike Davis is a scholar and um, NWA, they are artists. And so they're engaging in the, the documentation of similar phenomena, but taking very different approaches. Um, and as we know, if we're familiar with gangster rap from the 1990s, we see many critiques of law enforcement. We hear conversations about um, this lack of access to feeling safe in public space. And additionally, this um, critique of media representations of black youth become really central to um, what gangster rap is talking about um, in this particular moment as well. Okay, so we're probably familiar with NWA. Um, and we want to put this in the context of Operation Hammer that we talked about um, earlier. It comes out in 1989, so this was a fresh experience for individuals living um, in Los Angeles, um, and we are probably familiar with the song, um, Fuck the Police, and we want to sort of think about how this album, in many ways, for people that weren't living in Los Angeles, was a kind of opportunity to hear firsthand what was um, what the experience of being um, a youth of color in Los Angeles was like, how you were being viewed by the police, how you're being treated by the police, and how it made you feel as well. Okay, so um, when we are thinking about um, one of the terms that I'll talk about in a moment that's really important for um, Davis's chapter is the word carceral. Um, and carceral, we'll talk about a little bit more extensively, but this quote from the American Civil Liberties Union, or ACLU, um, gets us into what it actually means. What does carceral mean? So, uh, the political rhetoric about a war on drugs and a war on crime helped turn the police into soldiers, not civil servants or guardians of community order, making them sometimes more aggressive and forceful than they had a right to be. So this gives us a sense into the carceral mindset, essentially, that sees incarceration and criminalization as tools to create, um, quote unquote, peace or to create, quote unquote, order. Um, but again, right, it's thinking about the use of force um, to create these outcomes and the use of incarceration um, as a tool to create these outcomes. But then the question becomes, who are we creating these outcomes for? All right. So what's also happening in L.A. in the 80s and 90s is that there's um, this stepped up police uh, brutality, this stepped up aggression, these mass arrest campaigns that are happening um, on the part of the Los Angeles Police Department. But then we also see major cuts to the city budget under the Reagan administration, oops, um, who was then president. Um, and we also see some major shifts in the economy. This era is referred to as, right, an era that's marked by deindustrialization, which means that um, manufacturing jobs and factories are moving um, out of the city, um, resulting in the loss of quite a few um, decent paying jobs from the city as well. So we're thinking about how this is an era in which right people who are coming of age have less access to um, good paying jobs and are also experiencing um, this stepped up harassment on the part of the Los Angeles Police Department um, as well. Okay, so yes, yeah, so we are thinking about how we see this shift in thinking about how to solve the quote unquote problems of urban life. Um, so instead of thinking about public health, structural inequality, we see again this emphasis on incarceration as the solution.
Um, and all of this is happening at the same time, as Mike Davis will get into, um, that LA hosts the Olympics in the middle of the 1980s, and then also is bragging about the development of right this kind of downtown renaissance, a renaissance for downtown Los Angeles. So there's a lot of kind of contradictions that characterize um, what's going on in terms of public space in Los Angeles during this era. All right. So um, Fortress LA is the chapter we're reading this week. Um, so he argues, and this is what we're going to kind of track as you guys read the article, that LA was waging a war against authentic public spaces. And that's something we'll talk about. What does he mean by authentic? Um, so think about the title of his chapter. Pretty provocative. What does it mean? What does it tell us about the way that he interprets LA's changing landscape? Um, and then who is most impacted by the so-called war on public space? Okay. So a couple of terms that I wanted to go over before um, you guys read the chapter. Um, so liberal, post-liberal, and carceral pop up quite a bit in his chapter. Um, and I wanted to talk about what they mean in the context of Davis's writings more specifically, because we may have encountered these words before, but let's get into the details. Okay, so liberal in this context um, refers to these ideals of democratic openness and inclusiveness. And he specifically applies these terms to talk about um, public space. So a liberal public space um, kind of manifests these ideals of democratic openness and inclusiveness. Post-liberal, on the other hand, um, makes reference to trends in public space like privatization and controlled access. So kind of paying attention to the way um, he's distinguishing between these two different forms of public space will be useful. And then carceral, um, as I made mention of earlier, refers to an approach to problem solving that sees criminalization and incarceration as key tools. Um, so carceral comes from, we can see the root word in incarceration that is thinking about, um, right, how do we solve poverty? We criminalize it. How do we solve um, drug use? We criminalize it, right? So this kind of um, knee-jerk reaction to incarcerate or criminalize um, as a way to solve social problems that are complex and um, difficult to deal with. Okay, so then finally, what I want you all to think about when you are reading Davis. Um, so as I mentioned, his book was published in 1990. Um, so what do we see happening today in LA? Is LA hostile today? Do we see any similar tactics or patterns at play that um, Davis describes in his chapter? Okay, um, enjoy the chapter, and I look forward to seeing all of you in our Zoom meeting. Take it easy.